Oh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I hope uh, you can uh, see me and hear me. Okay, thank you. So, uh, some uh, administrative announcement. Uh, most of it you must have received it by now. We are going to start our labs from this Thursday, that is tomorrow. Uh, to make up for the time uh, which is lost, we are going to have two labs. Uh, we are going to convert the office hours into office hours slash lab. So you will be given one lab on Thursday and another lab on Monday. Uh, in each lab, you will be asked to solve or write small programs uh, in the class. And then, you know, the rest of the programs you will have to write as a homework and then submit it before a given deadline. Uh, apart from that, to prepare you for the midterm and, you know, in the type of the questions which will be asked, which will be more or less fill in the blanks or multiple choice kind of things. Uh, for that, uh, we are going to have uh, a quiz maybe once or twice a week. Uh, you will be taking the squeeze on Moodle. Uh, I have invited all of you to the Moodle, and I believe all of you must be having an account on Moodle. So you will be uh, taking a quiz. Initially, we will give you a liberal time that you know for a 25 question and one hour. But slowly, uh, in a couple of weeks, we will change it to a normal, like you know, one question a minute kind of thing, so that you know you get. Uh, the flavor of how to uh, take this exam, how to use your uh, arm quick reference uh, guide and solve problem using that. It's my uh, sincere request to you that you know you take the uh, uh, quiz and programming assignments very seriously and try to solve it on your own. There is no marks uh, deducted for uh, trying and not getting the correct answer. The marks will be deducted if you have not submitted the assignment. But you know any attempt on your part, an honest attempt, will be considered that you know you have submitted the assignment, even if it is wrong. Uh, you will be uh, counselled uh, if you have a question, and you know when they disclose the answer in the next lecture. If you don't understand it, then you know probably you can ask them for the explanation. So that is the administrative part. Also, our exam is fixed on 28th of uh, September, uh, 2.30 uh, to 3.30 p.m. So it will be a one hour exam. And I'll be asking 60 questions, 60 to 65, and you know there will be approximately one minute or less given for each question. The idea is less free time students have, less time they would use in copying. Also, there will be the different uh, question paper at least. And <laughs> yes, so can Excuse me, uh, Ketan Kunti, please turn off your mic. Uh, most of uh, there will be 10 copies of the question paper, and then you know each question paper will be jumbled. So do not write any wrong answer or anything, or do not copy. Uh, we'll talk about what are the disadvantages of copying later on when the exam comes. But today, let us start with uh, further study of some of the instructions that we are going to look at so can you see the slide yes sir okay so today we are going to talk about load store instruction as I told you earlier that arithmetic and logical instructions are, you know, very intuitive. Uh, you know what is add, multiply, divide, or end, XOR. 
all those things you know. Load store has a particular significance because in ARM architecture, as opposed to Intel architecture, ARM architecture is a load store architecture, and so is RISC V and so is MIPS. Now, in load store architecture, you can uh, address the memory. Either you store something into memory or get something from the memory it can be done only using two instructions, load and store. Never forget that. Now, there are various ways uh, you can use this load and store. So, first of all, you have single register data transfer. So, that is uh, that is LDR and STR. So that means you load one word into a register or STR means you store, uh, take one word from a given register and put it into memory location pointed by the other register. You can do block data transfer as it is shown over here. And you know, this was what I was referring to. Remember uh, when we were discussing the characteristics of a risk machine, where I said that all the instructions are fixed length, that is one cycle per instruction. Only load multiple and store multiple multiple instructions are such that they can take more than one cycle. And you know, they can take maximum of 13 cycles if you want to save all 13 registers. And you know, very soon in a couple of slides, you will know why load multiple and store multiple are important. Uh, I think you would have already guessed by now because you know you have studied interrupts. In interrupt, whenever an interrupt comes, you have to stop the user program. You have to save all the registers from R0 to uh, R13 on, on a stack pointer, on a stack. And then you know those registers will be used up by your interrupt handler, whatever interrupt is called. And once that interrupt uh, handler is done with its work, it will again call back user program. So you will again uh, bring back those uh, 12 register values which are stacked and which are stored in the stack memory and put it back into register R0 to R13. Now, when ev every time you know you want to take an interrupt, you don't want to write 13 load instructions that you know load R0, load R1, load R2, load R3. So that's why you are given load multiple instruction. Sorry, store multiple instructions that you know you take store the value of R0 into a particular stack memory location, R1 into the next location, R2 in the one after that, and so on and so forth. So load multiple and store multiple instructions are put to increase the code density because you know it would be tedious to write uh, 12 or 13 loads on 12 or 13 stores. You know, you have to write both because first you have to store them and then you have to load them back once the interrupt handler is done. So for that reason, you have load multiple and store multiple. Now, you know, then, you know, you may ask that you said the advantage of a microcontroller is that, you know, it has to be, can be interrupted and most of the microcontroller runs on purely on interrupt modes. You know, I mean, there is no user program. It just works on interrupt. So even if there is some program going on in the foreground, you know, as a main program, you know, which is watching for uh, signals coming in. Uh, if that is doing a load multiple and at that time other interrupt comes, then load multiple can be interrupted in the middle of an execution. So suppose load multiple says, you know, seven loads, R0 to R6. And, you know, you have done only R0 to R3. Four, five, and six are remaining and suddenly an interrupt comes. So you can break the instructions in the middle, uh, satisfy the interrupt handler, again come back and you know start from saving R5, R6, R7 and put them into uh, stack. So I mean, these are some of the features which are given in load multiple and store multiple. So it has a special significance and a special use. I mean, you can not necessarily that you know you have to write or use it only for interrupts. You can write for anything like, you know, for example, in your normal program, if you want to save four registers, say R0 to R3, I mean, the if you use uh, store multiple instruction, it's very simple. Store multiple uh, some value into bracket R, R0 dash R3, and you know, and starting from a particular location, it will be automatically 
placed over there one after the other, and you don't have to write three separate or four separate store instructions. So that is the uh, use of load and store that is LDR, STR, LDM and STM. As you will see, this LDR is different from the pseudo instructions which I discussed yesterday, which was LDA. Now, LDA was is called a pseudo instruction because there is no ARM instruction like LDA, but you know, it is made for the convenience of a programmer. Suppose you want to write a very simple program which just takes two value content of the two registers, adds them and put them into the third register. Uh, then, you know, first of all, you have to load the values into R1. Suppose, say, you have to do add R1, R2, R3. So, first of all, you have to load values into R2 and value into R3, right? You know, otherwise, what will it add? So, you can write LDA, R2, and then, you know, given format, and then 32-bit uh, uh, constant, and then, uh, again, you write LDA, and then, you know, R3 equal, and then another 32-bit. Then you leave it to the compiler to figure out a way or find out a good uh, instruction to fulfill that pseudo instruction. It could be a MO instruction, or it could be a combination of some instructions. You know, that you don't worry because you know that is too much of a work. So LDA is type of a load, but it is not a proper instruction. It is just a pseudo instruction given for the convenience. Whereas LDR and STR are instructions. Now, one thing, you know, probably you would have guessed by now, uh, can people turn off their mics because, you know, it is very disturbing all the noises coming through. Okay, Rajesh, please turn off your mic. Okay, now let me ask you a question. Probably you should know the answer by now. Okay, now you have some, you have to write a loop, okay? Your for loop. How do you like, uh, so suppose if I say that, you know, you have to take a loop 100 times and then exit when you, re, um, the count is exceeding 100. So how do you write? Do you start from zero? Or what number do you start from? Normally you do this, right? I mean, I'm writing this pseudo thing, so don't worry about the uh, syntax. And is this how you write? Can someone answer me? I mean, for your normal programs? Okay. Normal programs, but in AM we will start from hundred and decrease by one. So when okay, and what would be the reason? Uh, so when it will become zero. So why would we do that? that? Yes, uh, I mean we do that, but you know what's the reason? Uh, I have read, but I forgot. Okay. Say so normally, I mean, this is very intuitive to us. You know, you start counting from zero and then, you know, you go up to a certain number and if the value is either less than that number or equal to that number, you stop at that particular point. Now, this is, I mean, there is nothing wrong uh, uh, in argumentation or, uh, you know, in syntax. You know, I mean, this is a perfectly normal way. But, you know, the whole purpose of studying the architecture is that, you know, you write better programs which are helpful to your processor to speed up. Now, as uh, someone suggested that, you know, actually you should start from, say, I equal to zero, or sorry, I equal to 100, and then, you know, stop and something like this. Now, what is the reason for this? The reason for this is, suppose if you go like this, 
then you know you have to store the value 100 in one of the registers. So you have got R0 to R13. These are general purpose register. So one register will always be blocked with the value 100 because you know naturally you have to check in a loop. There might be five instructions, and in every fifth instruction is you know conditional check that you know whether this condition is met or not. So you have to. I mean, it makes sense to keep this in register and not to go to memory every time because it will waste time. So you have to block one register. Instead of that, if you do the other way around, you know, you saw that compare instruction. Or you saw this sub instruction with an S suffix. So suppose if you are storing this in R1, the counter initialize with 100, then you say R1, R1 minus 1, right? Or something like this. So you keep on subtracting 1 from this R1 and putting it back into R1. And you know, because of this S flag, as soon as R1 becomes 0, the flag will go up and you know you will stop your executing your program you will not have to waste uh, any register i mean of course there is one counter that is i mean given you know that counter will have to be there whether you use this or this but you know apart from the counter you will also have to save the max value so you know you will be wasting two registers whereas here only one register is there which is the counter and uh, you don't have to check the max value you just have to check for zero and because of this zero i mean you will it will just raise the flag, flag or you know you will use the compare instruction r1 and uh, and then you know if the result is zero r1 gets r1 and one then you know you will then you know you will if it is zero then you know automatically flag will go up and you know if the flag goes up you know that means your condition is met and you know you will exit. Does it make sense to you? So this is called a good programming practice as opposed to this. I mean, of course, this will give you correct answer. You know, programs written using loop like this will also give you correct answer, and this will also give you correct answer. But you know, when we go for implementation and see uh, actually memory usage and register usage, you will realize that in risk machine, you know, there is a saying, you can't have too many registers, you know, more the merrier. I mean, why just R13? I mean, why not have 100 registers? Why not have 200 registers? Why just 16? Well, I mean, at that particular point, you know, we are going to discuss the pros and cons of having more registers or less registers. But in ARM, there are a fixed number of registers, you know, and that register number is going to remain constant, whether you're talking about microcontroller or an application processor which is used in your uh, mobile or even laptop. So those registers number is going to remain constant. And uh, there's a reason for that, you know, we are going to talk about it. Very interesting phenomena, but you know this, you must remember that this is how you should program. I mean, whether you are using ARM or anything else, because this will take max value storage will take up another register and registers are very valuable. You don't want to unnecessarily use up the register. I hope this concept is clear. Okay. Now there are interesting things. You can load a register, that means a word. You can store a word. You can store a byte or you can load a byte. Now, you know, you can uh, load a half word or you can store a half word. That means 16 uh, bytes. See, when you say load a byte, you what you do is, or what your hardware will do is, in a 32-bit register, it will store a byte between this location and you know whatever that byte is 1 0 0 1 1 1 something and fill up the rest with all zeros 
I mean, this is very necessary because, you know, if some junk is lying out here, because, you know, then add, subtract, everything is done using 32-bit notation. So if there is some junk like which is lying here from previous calculation, then, you know, it would be considered as some number. So when you have a store or uh, load a byte, you bring in one byte from memory, you store it in the least significant byte, and then, you know, Make the, your hardware will automatically make other uh, bits as zero zero. Same thing for half word. You know it will come up to fifteen, zero to fifteen, and then fifteen to thirty one would be all zeros. Right, so so that there is no uh, problem in uh, calculation. You can also do conditional execution. So you know once again. You will load something if it is equal or you know it is something you know greater than or less than. So you know you can also use conditional statement over here and again increase your code density. So this is something you know you need to uh, remember that a lot of stuff is given to increase uh, code density. And code density, I told tell you time and again that you know memory costs money. Less memory is used. Uh, better it is, you know, you can sell your device cheaper. Now comes your store word or byte. Now, you know, you must have studied pointers in C language. And some of you may have kind of a problem understanding pointer because I know from my experience from student days that, you know, pointer used to be a killer concept. But you know, when you study assembly language, it becomes very simple. There is a store instruction. So str r0 r1. So basically your r1, the content of register r1 is not the value. Content of register r1 gives you address in the memory. So whatever address, 32-bit address is given, so you are supposed to, when I say you means the hardware, we'll have to take the value which is stored in register R1 and store it into address which is given by content of register R1. So in that particular uh, circumstance, R1 is storing an address but not the value. Okay, so that is the whole concept of pointer. So here it is very obvious. Similarly, load R2 and into the square bracket. Whenever a square bracket is done, that means you are supposed to take, consider that as an address. So the content of R1 is basically showing address in the memory. So here, load R2 and you know if and the square bracket R1, if this is the written, so that means you are supposed to go to the address which is shown by the content of R1 and, you know, go to that particular location in the memory, bring that word and put it into register R2. So this is what basic simple load and store means. And, you know, this is explained and, you know, it is explained very well in your book, how to load and store various numbers. Now, there are, uh, you can have various ways of doing it. You know, there is something which is known as pre-index addressing and something which is known as post-index addressing. Now, as I told you, that many times we are wondering that, you know, why is it necessary to give two options? You know, I mean, can't they just give one option and make things simple that, you know, just have pre-index addressing? But, you know, there are many reasons, you know, which are there for business reason rather than technical reason. Technically, you can either give pre-index addressing and, you know, force everyone to write a program which uses pre-index addressing. Or conversely, just define post-index addressing and force all the programmers to use post-index addressing. But when this ARM architecture came through, there are a lot of people who are working on other types of uh, microcontroller uh, like PIC or uh, uh, Intel, <clears throat> they were used to one or the other type of addressing modes. 
an arm need to attract all kinds of clients and how do you attract clients you attract clients say okay why don't you use this particular processor you know it has got all instructions you can keep your programming style as you like and you know we have got a solution for that so that's why they have to give pre index uh, addressing and post index addressing mode so here you can see that you know you can give your address in a pretty complicated way and in fact there you can even give more complicated way you can write r1 comma r2 comma uh, number 12 so that means add the content of register r1 with the content of register r2 and plus add 12 to them and you know you can write very complicated thing so this in itself requires an alu for address calculation right so this has got consequence in a five stage machine you will realize that memory access stage so the stage where load and store can access memory comes after alu stage so in alu stage this address calculation will be done so you have to find out the effective address where do i have to store the value of r0 uh, content of register r0 is to be stored into a memory whose effective address would be given by the content of register r1 plus adding 12 to it and that would give you the address where you are supposed to store r0 content of r0 now this one is that you know you increment the content of r1 by 12 so that means pre index addressing so you know there is a pointer which is given well, you know you must be aware of the you know, stack pointer so you know you want to start from the stack pointer you know its programming style or the stack pointer is here it is pointing to the last filled uh, location and so that you know you want to start from the next location so in that case pre index addressing is required so that you know uh, suppose your pointer is pointing to the last filled location so r1 is pointing to that so you want to increment it by some number and then store uh, the content of r0 into that particular location now the difference between first and second example which i have given you know the it is exactly similar except this uh, sign which is exclamation mark which is given that you know in this particular thing you are not updating the value of r1 value of r1 will remain the same now let us suppose if you are writing a program you know this is part of a loop that you know you find out the value of uh, register r0 and then you know you want to store it in an array and then you know again go it increment it then store it into r0 and then store it into another memory location in that array so in that particular thing you want the value of r1 to be updated so the next one when you use instruction like this the value of r1 is already r1 plus 12 from the previous calculation so that means you go to the next one so in that particular case if you want to use this as a part of a loop you will put an exclamation mark after this in programming so that your compiler understands that you have to update the value of r1 and then you know next time when you come the value of r1 it would already be an updated value of r1 that means r1 plus 12 and again at 12 to that it offset so that you know it goes to the next location and next location and so on now some people like post index addressing so that means suppose there is pointer or stack pointer whatever you take it is pointing to the first empty location and you know again there is a programming style if your pointer is pointing to the first empty location then you know you want to store the value into that and then go to the next location so in that particular case you use post index addressing so in post index addressing you store R, uh, the content of register r0 into memory location which is shown by the content of r1 you store it there and then increment the value of r1 by 12 right so the next time suppose if it is used in a loop so next time when it comes to r1 the value would have already been updated now here there is no need to put this ampersand because you know by default it is updating the value of register r1 there is no option that it is not updating the value of r1 so here there is there are no two separate two cases of having no uh, 
exclamation mark and exclamation mark. Here, there's no need for it because, you know, this is effectively like this. So that value of R1 will be updated post storing of R0. Okay. Now, you know, whatever I have put a store, you know, you can replace it with load and, you know, it would have a meaning, the reverse meaning that, you know, take the content. Suppose if I have written LDR over here. So what it means is that uh, take the uh, content from uh, address calculation of, you know, content of R1, add 12 to it, get something from that memory and store it and, and put it into register R0. So that is loading into register. So that is LDR. So you can replace this STR with LDR. Of course, meaning would change, but you know, they would all be legitimate instructions. Does anyone have any question in this one? These kind of instructions are pretty favorite. Uh, when they're asking, you know, I mean, as I told you, there are four or five types of questions which can ask in multiple choice or fill in the blanks or give a answer. And that answer is, I mean, usually it is asked that, you know, whether this, what would be the output of this instruction? What would be the output of this register? Uh, or, you know, where this particular value would be stored? I mean, these kind of questions, you need to remember this subtle differences between, you know, having an uh, exclamation mark and not having an exclamation mark and where it would store and where it would not store. Okay, so if everyone is clear, I will move forward. So this is, I mean, explained to you in uh, simple terms. And, you know, this is graphically it is given, you know, what would be the content of our register R0 and where it would be stored, etc. You can see here, this one is important. You are doing something like this. You are doing logical left shift. Now, what you are saying is content of R2 you do logical left shift by two bits. So that means it is tantamount to you're multiplying it with four, right? You know, if you're shifting by, by two bits on the left hand side, that means you are multiplying it with four. So that means what you are effectively saying is that my address would be the content of register R1 plus four times R2, right? You are uh, quadrupling. Uh, the content of R2, putting them together and then getting that particular address and then, you know, storing the value into R0. So these are various examples which are given. You can go through these examples. Uh, these are basically straight from the textbook. You can go and take a look there. Now, this is, I would, uh, I think this is also very similar to what you have done. Uh, again, this is given in the book. You can read it from the book, and I'm also going to share my slides uh, today. So you can take a look at it. Now, there is one very important concept, effect of endianness. Now, you know, uh, the word endianness has come from, you know, those of you who have read Alice in the Wonderland. I mean, there were, I mean, Alice ends up in an island where there were two groups who were fighting with each other. And, you know, the one group was saying that eggs should be cracked 
at the big end. You know, of course, you all remember the shape of egg. Another group was saying that, you know, you have to crack the egg or break the egg from the little end. So that's why the word big Andean and little Andean came. Now, you know, they have, uh, ARM has used this thing. And, you know, I mean, there is a particular reason. Now, let us say that I'm using, I said, you know, instruction one. And, you know, four bytes are reserved for it, right? You know, one word. So this is say zero, one, two, and three. So there are four bytes. Now the question is, where should MSB, that is most most significant byte, where will it go? Should it be here or should it be here? You know, our think thinking is. Like, you know, we write the most significant bit, bit here because, you know, that's how we write numbers. So that, you know, we naturally feel that, you know, the biggest byte should be here, then the next one and the next one, and then the least significant byte should be here. But that is not the only way. Some people think, some mathematicians think the logical way of writing it is that, you know, most significant bit uh, byte should be here, then the next one and the next one and the least significant byte should be here. So most significant byte should correspond to the higher number of uh, byte address. Well, both of them are correct. I mean, it depends on how you design your hardware, right? Because <clears throat> there is nothing right or wrong uh, if you design the right hardware for it. But you know, this causes <coughs> a lot of problem in communication. <coughs> Because, you know, there are lots of legacy devices. So someone who is making a particular kind of sensor chip is using a big Andean notation. It is passing a signal to a processor which is using little Andean. So this one is big Andean. This one is a little Andean. Now, there would not be much of a problem if all four bytes, that means a word is used, right? So if you're transferring a word, then, you know, most significant byte, each one would know where to put it. So whether it's a big Andean coming from big Andean to little Andean, little Andean to big Andean would not cause that much of a problem. The problem will come when, when you're talking of half words and bytes. Then, you know, you have a problem that, you know, if they don't understand the Andeanness of each other, <coughs> Then, you know, the big Indian one, if it sends a byte, then, you know, the meaning would be totally different. Little Indian system wala would be sending a byte from its most significant bit or most significant byte. And, you know, it would be interpreted as a least significant byte by the uh, big Indian system. So that's why ARM um, in its hardware has made this feature that it would work on both little Indian and big Indian system only that, you know, it has to be told by it. In your programming, you don't have to worry about it. I mean, this is only when you are start designing a system on a chip. You're trying to integrate your processor with some other manufacturers, uh, either processors or modems or whatever. Then this question would arise. But, you know, you must remember what Andeanness is and what is its significance. So, <clears throat> This is something like this. That you know, suppose you want to store a number, a hexadecimal number, which is 0A, 0B, 0C, 0D, in memory location, which is starting from hexadecimal number 8000. 8, excuse me. So if you store it in the little Indian system, your least significant memory location, I mean your smallest memory location number-wise, will store the least significant bit. So this, according to little Indian, would be stored here. Then the next one, the next one, and the next one. In big Indian, it is exactly opposite or, you know, something that, you know, what we are used to. You know, we write numbers like this. 
So we also feel that we should see a number like this stored like this. So 0A should be here, 0B should be here, 0C should be here, and 0D should be here. So excuse me, uh, can you just give me uh, one minute? Okay, sorry about that. So this is the little Indian and the big Indian system. You need to remember this. That you know, if you want to see one and the other, you know this. Again, this questions are favorite <coughs> to be asked. That you know, where would the little Indian system go, or how it would be represented, or where it would be stored in little Indian system or big Indian system. Any question here? Okay, so this are some of the examples which are given how to store things. Now comes your block data transfer. Now, you have got this, that there are four different addressing modes allow increment and decrement inclusive or exclusive of base register location. So let us take a look at the example which is given over here. So you have LDM or STM. Then, you know, as I told you, you can have this conditional. So, I mean, this is optional. If there is no condition, can someone tell me what would, suppose if you want to just load multiple or store multiple or just for that matter, add or subtract, you don't have any condition. Then what condition flag would you set? Sir, A flag. I'm sorry? A flag, always. Can you give me always, right. So if you have no condition, that means by default, you are saying always. So you all, all add or subtract or you know load or load multiple store or store multiple, no matter what the condition and it means there is no condition. So you put always. So remember that. Now it has got uh, various uh, things. Uh, so for example, then you know is an expression evaluating to a valid register number. So you can have this number, then you know that this is your exclamation mark. And this ampersand is uh, used only uh, when you are doing, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, interrupt handler. So that means, you know, in interrupt handler, and I know I remember that, you know, I broke off in the middle uh, to jump from interrupt to explaining you important instructions. For the simple reason that you know from tomorrow you are going to have your lab so some of the instructions you should be familiar with other instructions are you know pretty intuitive so but then you know i have just taken up those instructions you know which are not very intuitive and you know it has got like you know some special way of writing it so those are the instructions i have discussed i will this is known as carrot a carriage sign and you know i will uh, tell you that you know why it is used when i discuss uh, interrupt handlers so these are the things you know which you have this is term called increment after so this is ldm r9 r0 to r3 so when you are putting this you are saying that you know take the content uh, uh, say r0 and put it into register r9 now 
as you will see here, this is increment after. So first word is loaded into a location uh, which is shown by content of register R9. So register R9 ha has an address in the memory. Now R0 will be stored into that location. Now increment after is then you know the next one it will automatically be augmented by four bytes. That means the next word, right? You know, array every data is 32 bit. So the next word and then next word and then next word. So I think this is um, kind of intuitive to you if you are usually familiar with putting it the pointer or the array at a point, you know, the first unfilled one or first empty location. So then, you know, you use increment after. If you use the other way around that, you know, your pointer is pointing to a location which is the last filled one, then, you know, you have to increment before. So if you do increment before at, or LDM IB, then, you know, if the same uh, thing, you know, here instead of A, if you write B, then your R0 will be stored into R9, uh, comma number 4. So that means R9 plus 4. This will be R9 plus 8, R9 plus 12, and R9 plus 16. Right? So this is increment after and increment before. And this is very much like uh, we saw this thing, you know, using uh, exclamation mark and not using an exclamation mark. Now here, that notation is not used, but you know, it is used increment after and increment before. So it's LDM IA and LDM IB. Similarly, you can have decrement after and decrement before. So that means, is your array, you know, you want to grow it down or you want to grow it up? So this one, you know, it is like, you know, if your memory location, if it is starting from 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, then think it is like growing down. So that means from here, you want to go here, 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 here in the storing of your array. Some people like 0 at the bottom. And then, you know, keep on going up. So it is depending on your design style. How do you like to uh, define your stack? So you want to start growing from the bottom and then, you know, it just stacks up or it stacks down that, you know, you this is your highest and then, you know, you go down like this. So any which way you want to write. And, you know, of course, a general purpose processor has to satisfy all types of, you know, programming practices which are used by people. Uh, it is not that, you know, you have to have both IA and uh, IB and DA and DB. I mean, you could have done with just one and saying that, you know, okay, everyone is supposed to program like this, but you know, that's not how programmers work. You know how choosy the programmers are because, you know, after all, when you come uh, in the market with a new product, you want your product to sell. And if you want your product to sell, you know, you have to make it comfortable for programmer to use it. And if the programmers are used to write, writing program in certain way, and those convention has to be followed. And, you know, you must remember that ARM is not a very old processor. ARM was designed or, you know, first ARM processor came out in 1990s. So that means by that time, C programming was there, C++ was there. And, you know, people had formed certain habits of writing C program or C++ program, and they wanted their equivalents to be reflected into assembly language also. So that's why, you know, you have these kind of uh, things. Similarly, uh, if you are storing into stack, you have got fully descending stack and, you know, fully ascending stack. So while you are storing in a memory, you know, you use the word like FD or FA after it. So you can have design your stack, which is descending or which is ascending. Uh, it is like, you know, uh, or, you know, you can have uh, E means empty stacks. That means a stack pointer will point to the next free space in the stack. So hence you can have ED or EA. So F stands for full. So it is pointing to a full location and then you're going down and up. Or, you know, it is pointing to an empty location. And then, you know, whether your stack is designed to go up or go down. So once again, it is for the convenience of the uh, writer. So, I mean, this is 
a conclusion which is given over here. Also in your book, it is given. And these are some of the examples, um, again, taken from the book. Uh, uh, probably I need to differentiate this, that, you know, this example, I mean, this particular thing is used by interrupt handlers. And, you know, you are saying this in this interrupt handler that, you know, you are want to save it in the stack. And then, you know, you want to save it and, you know, when you do this, you know, also CPSR and uh, value would be stored into SPSR and many other things would become. Whereas, you know, if you are just saving it as a part of your user program, then, you know, I mean, it is not necessary that LDM and STM instructions are used only for interrupts. You can use it for your normal programs. So you can write uh, uh, LDM instruction in your program if you want to, four values have been generated in R0, R1, R2, R3. Then, you know, you put those values into uh, uh, a memory location by using writing just one instruction like LDM. Uh, you could write, you know, LDR four times, you know, I mean, there's nothing wrong in that program. But then, you know, I mean, this is density of code. Anything else? Or does anyone want, and does anyone have any question? Okay. Uh, the stack operation and subroutine, uh, we will be doing probably after midterm. So I'm not going after that. Uh, but, you know, this is basically I have covered all the instructions which are slightly different from your normal uh, thing. So we have talked about, first of all, you know, we started talking about compare instruction and test. And we understood that, you know, this basically they're known as a testing instruction. So compare and test don't give any output uh, on the screen or, you know, in the program. But all it does is sets or resets the flag. Then we talked about that, you know, you can obviate the need for compare if you have S extension and you can use that S extension after any arithmetical instruction. Normally, simple arithmetic instruction, if you have written like sub or add, or even here it makes more sense to put a sub that, you know, if you use a sub instruction, sub R1, comma R1, comma 1, then, you know, even if R1 value becomes zero, you will have to write compare instruction of R1 to zero. And then, you know, if it is zero, then only flag would be set. But, you know, if you don't want to write compare instruction, you can write straight sub S R1 comma R1 uh, comma number one. So as soon as, you know, you keep on doing R1 minus one in a loop, if that instruction, if it is in a loop, and then, you know, when it R1 becomes zero, it would automatically set the flag and, you know, that would give you a signal that, okay, you need to exit this particular loop. So we saw that S flag extension. We also saw conditional execution that, you know, there are 16 types of condition. And, you know, that condition is very important that, you know, if you want to avoid this branch instruction, then, you know, you just write add in a conditional way that, you know, you add it only if the condition for a previous output is met. So if that is not met, then that, you know, you, uh, the program would simply jump over that instruction and start executing the next instruction. So, you know, you are saving the branch instruction and, you know, we will see that based on the number of pipeline stages, branch instruction wastes a lot of time. Uh, uh, that would become clear uh, when we start studying uh, processor implementation. But to this point, you know, I would like to tell you that uh, you need to look at uh, these two uh, conditions which are given that, you know, what are the conditions which are used? What are the flags which are used? Then, you know, load and store instructions in you know, various ways of using them. And then, you know, uh, 
uh, ways of using load multiple and store multiple instructions. We also talked about branch condition. That simple B is simple branch. That you know branch to a particular address. And then you know it's like go to statement in your program. That you know I mean you it it's unconditional branch. You do, it doesn't depend on any result. If you have conditional branch, then you know you have you are using conditional statement with B. So B if equal so so B EQ uh, B not equal. Uh, greater than or uh, equal to, less than or equal to. I mean, those conditions you can use for branching. And then, you know, it would give you a proper answer. So that is your branch condition. We also look at a special type of instruction, which is known as BX. And, you know, this branch in exchange kind of thing. So that means if you want to jump from, say, ARM format to thumb format, you write BX. So that means it would understand that, you know, till this point you are writing in ARM, now you know you are changing. So it is like a toggle. Once you write BX, it would change from arm to thumb. Another time you write a BX, it would change from thumb to arm. So you can mix and match. In fact, the compilers, your Kyle compiler now, you know, you will also be writing a program where it can use mix, you can mix a C program and, and an ARM assembly language program together. And I told you it has got a lot of significance. That, you know, suppose if you are working in some company which is working on, say, high-end audio product, and that particular audio product requires you to know the value of a particular bit. Now, C language does not have uh, any particular instruction which will go and check the value of a particular bit. So, I mean, you can easily write a small subroutine in ARM assembly language and there, you know, you can do XOR or prepare a mask and, you know, so that, you know, if you want to find out the value of the 26th bit, you can tell that, you know, whether that particular bit is zero or one uh, by output and then, you know, uh, take proper action in your program. So you can, it is always possible to mix C and assembly language. Uh, before we end today, I would like to show you the importance of learning ARM assembly language. ARM assembly language, learning the ARM assembly language by itself is a skill set. So just write, you know, you, you write in your resume that you know C, C++, or Python. Similarly, you can write that you know you know ARM assembly language. Now, you know, your next question would be, where would, or where are the jobs? Suppose if I am a very good uh, writer, or I got very good understanding of uh, writing ARM programs. Where can I get the job? Simply based on my ARM assembly language programming techniques. So let me put you put it this way. In India, there is a large testing center that you know whenever the processor design is done. For like you know, then there is say Qualcomm designs a processor. Uh, you know the latest processor which is coming great, which is used in your Snapdragon uh, soft. Similarly, uh, Samsung is designing a processor for his Exynos. MediaTek is doing it. And then, you know, there is a Broadcom which is writing its own, I mean, designing its own processor. So is Apple. All of their centers for validation are in India. So uh, one of the first entry-level job condition is you write test programs and you write test programs in such a way that you know you need to have an idea of the architecture so that you write a test program so that it can test each and every bit of your processor and you know each and every memory location you know it would go and you know probe memory location so that you know you know your processor is working properly and there is no stuck at zero fault or stuck at one fault so that means no bit is like you know always showing zero even if it is supposed to change so the first job profile which is available is you know writing test programs to validate a processor because you know without that a processor cannot be marketed the second thing a job in arm itself because you know all the companies have to send this processor for getting a certificate from arm that this processor is arm compliant so if a processor comes to arm you know arm has got a large army of engineers who again you know test each one of them to make sure that they are compliant to ARM architecture. 
So once again, having or be something being ARM architecture compliant is it should be able to use all instructions which are defined by that particular architecture set. It should be satisfying all the interrupt and you know have proper interrupt handlers for those interrupts. It should have fixed number of registers. And you know, I mean, that register is always 17 visible register and 37 registers at all time. And finally, uh, it should have a memory map. Now, memory map could be different from processor to processor. So that you know, they have to each processor uh, designer has to give that information to ARM. But at least ARM testing is done for checking the compliance of all uh, ARM instructions. So that is the long and short of uh, ARM architecture and how to design it. Uh, I do not wish to go into uh, explaining interrupt because you know there is not sufficient time and then I would require some time. I want to take some time in explaining uh, <clears throat> interrupts. So we stop at this point. Does anyone have any questions? Has everyone yes, got? Uh, yes, sir. does anyone have any question? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, sir, my question is, sir, can you please explain this LDM FD instruction? Okay. So it is full. Look at this. Uh, where is it? Uh, okay. So you have got fully. Full descending, empty descending, full ascending, empty ascending. So it uh, depends, you know, whether you're pointing it to the last full one or the first empty one, and then uh, whether you are going up or down. Does it make sense? You know, that's the uh, shortest explanation. Uh, yes. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Right. So I mean, you know, you must have done it in programming. Uh, I don't know whether you use malloc or alloc or some such thing. Or you know, define the stack. When you define the stack, you want to point uh, point it at the first empty location or the last filled location, right? So that is that's where E and F comes in. And then whether you want to go in up direction or down direction. So up is ascending, down is descending. Any other question, uh, sir? Uh... VZs are just for practice purpose, right? Means it, it doesn't contain any weightage. I, I, I'm sorry. What is for practice purpose? Uh, I, I, you told uh, from uh, this week uh, uh, onwards, we have one or two quizzes a week. So they, these quizzes are just for practice purpose, right? Correct. Okay. And I want, I mean, I, I purposely kept it that way. So that everyone would attempt it, you know, I mean, because, you know, that would give you an idea how good you are. So, I mean, or how not good you are. So if you feel that, you know, okay, you are not getting uh, good marks, then, you know, probably you need to work harder on certain aspects because, you know, it requires, I mean, to solve those questions quickly, because, you know, if I give you sufficient time, you can, every one of you can solve those questions, but you know, I want you to have an eye for an, to finding out an error. And that's why I'm giving you a short time. So in short time, you know, you should have a mind, which is working very quickly to figure out, okay, where is the error? Because, you know, bug catching is the biggest thing in programming. So if you are given a short time and within short time, if you can figure out, okay, what will be the output of this instruction? What will be the output of this program? Or where is the problem in this program? Or where is the, uh, uh, you know, uh, what would be the status of a particular register after certain iterations? So those things you need to get, and that, those things you can get only if you write program on Kyle compiler. <clears throat> in fact, you know, after write, after taking one or two quiz, you know, you yourself would become good enough to design questions. I mean, you can design any question and you, know, you can check the answer uh, by using Kyle compiler. You can write just a very small program. Uh, so for example, you know, I'm giving you a very trivial example. If I have given you a program like, you know, load R1, R2, R3, 
what would be the output? And I have defined some values for R2 and R3. So if you want to check, I mean, this is a trivial example, then you write a small program, you know, by defining area and then say LDA R2 some number, LDA R3 some number, then, you know, you do uh, add instruction and then finally you store it in a particular memory location and then you get an output. So you can see what that output is. So, right, so you can test that particular thing and you can get an answer. So I hope everyone is, I mean, there are 328 people who are registered in Google Classroom and I hope that is the class strength. Uh, previously, there were 360 students admitted, so rest of the students either may have fallen out or may have left the college or may not have registered, so I don't know which one is true. Uh, also, uh, Moodle, I have sent you, uh, I mean, I've added all of you uh, based on the numbers or email IDs which were provided in the list of registered students. It may happen some of you have not yet registered for whatever reason, or, you know, your registration was late and it has not come to that particular point and things are not added. So for that, you know, you need to talk to your TAs uh, and, you know, just tell them that, you know, this is your number, you're registered late and your number is not there. It also makes eminent sense, at least initially, to talk to your friends that, you know, or you know, keep in touch with each other so that, you know, suppose if you have not gotten a ma mail for something and if your friend has got it, then, you know, you think that, okay, there is something wrong and I'm not getting the mail. So you can work on it. Okay, anything else? Sir. Sir. Yes. Sir, quiz kab hogi? I'm sorry? Quiz kab hogi? Sir, means uh, aaj hai ya? No, 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 <laughs> it's not today. So as I told you, okay, uh, the thing would be that you will be given a set of uh, programming assignments. Okay, uh, someone has asked a question about LDA. I mean, after I answer this question, I would want that person to repeat it. Okay, so you are given a programming assignment today. Some of the programs, you know, you are supposed to solve it online, you know, when TAs are present. Rest of the problems, you are supposed to solve it as a homework problem. Now, usually, uh, based on whatever instructions you had to use, in designing that program, the quiz more or less will be designed based on those instructions, right? And that would be given to you, I mean, earliest could be from next Monday. And, you know, just as the quiz says that, you know, quiz is a quiz, so you have to keep on uh, studying. I mean, that you have got one thing that, you know, at least initial quiz, unless I say otherwise, uh, the quiz are not graded, but, you know, you have to attempt it and you have to attempt it honestly. And then, you know, you will realize that, you know, whether you are reading properly or not. And the whole reason for taking quiz with a shorter notice is that, you know, I want you to study. Okay, someone asked a question about LDA. Uh, can that person repeat it? The question which was asked was, sir, what is use of LDA pseudo instruction? Uh, okay, so LDA, as we discussed, pseudo instruction is, you know, is the ease of use of like putting constants into registers R2 and R3. Say, for example, if you're writing a program uh, and, you know, you want to set the counter to 100 and then, you know, want to reduce it. So initially you want to put a counter or a 32 bit, I mean, in a th so basically a 32 bit value in a particular register. Now, as you see that, you know, all the instructions which are given to you, it will not allow you to fill 32 bits, right? You know, because conditional statements take up four bits, opcode itself take up certain number of bits. So the maximum number of bits which are open, I mean, in some cases, as you can see, uh, the branch instruction type, you know, is like 20 or 22. So, you know, you even if you shift it by 
two bit two digits because of you know in a word last two bits are uh, last two bits are always zero zero and if you ignore it even then you know you will get plus minus 32 mb so you will not get a number which is greater than that then you know how do you generate that number you know then there are lots of uh, things which are given that you know you can do rotation scheme you can uh, use move instruction you know do some rotation scheme you know add it something to pc get a value but you know it is it would be too much of a problem for you to actually figure out how to put a certain value into register r2 so whereas to avoid that problem on your part they are giving you a simple way that you leave that problem to your compiler compiler will figure out a way to do it all you have to simply say is load a 32 bit number into a particular register so there is no instruction like that that's why it is called pseudo instruction okay so i think uh, uh sir we stop here there are no yes go ahead sir uh, we have uh, compilers that comp uh, may we have converters that convert c language to assembly language so sir why are we need to learn assembly okay there are compilers available which can convert a uh, c language into assembly language but you know if you want to study a uh, computer architecture and computer architecture in a proper way then you need to know what each instruction is doing because the way an instruction is executed will give you an idea about the processor architecture i mean that is number 1 number 2 is when a compiler compiles a program and gives you an output uh, in arm assembly language it would be a better output than a novice programmer a programmer who has just written arm so you know if you write a program in arm you know with just a uh, few i mean few weeks of practice in arm assembly language your programming will not be as good as what a compiler can give you but you know if you have been programming for two or three years and then you know uh, you can write a much denser code than what a compiler can give you because compiler may or may not know or you know compiler always gives you a very conservative uh, program and you if you know your program thoroughly you can write a much better uh, arm assembly language code and you know if you are designing a game or designing an audio product high end audio product then you know time is of essence even few microseconds or few nanoseconds means a lot Okay, does that answer your question? Yes, sir. Okay, so we stop and, here. Yeah, go and ahead. And sir, uh, do we have lab on Monday as well as Thursday for for whole sem? Well, I mean, uh, let's worry about uh, till the first midterm. We'll take a call after that. I think the lab will uh, stop after that. You know, then labs will be converted into assignments because the second part. Uh, I cannot, I mean, I wanted to keep a lab and, you know, this, I wanted to introduce hardware description language, but, you know, all the software, which I took, uh, took, uh, take a look at, you know, it has got like seven or eight GB, uh, thing is used. I mean, we have it in our university, but, you know, downloading it might be a problem for a lot of people, you know, it might take up their bandwidth for a whole day or, you know, two, three days. So that's why I mean I need to think about it, and we will discuss uh, post uh, midterm. Okay, sir. Thank you. Okay, thank you.